This is our fourth and final day of uh, hearings on hospital budgets. Uh, you might want to say that we saved the best for last. <laughs> 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 Uh, I'm going to start out, uh, Pat, if you could uh, give us the normal drill. Sure. Um, I'll take you through the agenda for today and then a brief timeline of um, the hospital budget <coughs> process. And then just a word about the role of the board. So um, after we do the uh, timeline, we'll hear from Matt Scottney, um Hospital and Health Center, and they're all um, ready to go, I see. And then Springfield Hospital will join us as well. And then um, Vaz, uh, Jeff Tiemann from Vaz will then um, sort of do a wrap up um, after we hear from Springfield. And then time permitting, we will begin the Green Mountain Care Board's discussion. In terms of the timeline, um, we received budget submissions in early July from each of the hospitals. <coughs> Our um, small but mighty hospital budget team, um, and I want to really call out Kelly Thoreau, Lori Perry, Tom Crafton, Harriet Johnson, um, and Christina McLaughlin as well um, for really pulling together during this extremely busy time of the board. Um, but July and August really are devoted to um, detailed staff review. We provide each hospital with our staff analyses on uh, July 30th and then heard back from the hospitals in response to our questions by August 10th. Uh, this is our last day of uh, hospital budget hearings and the deadline for public comment on the hospital budgets will be September 10th. The board will pretty much immediately um, begin um, discussion that is in public meetings and will ultimately make decisions about each hospital's net patient revenue and its rate by September 14th. That meets our statutory deadline of September 15th. And then um, written orders will be provided to the hospitals by September 28th. Again, that meets our statutory deadline for October 1st. So that's the, that's the timeline. Uh, the next slide shows um, some resources that are available, um, links to the hearing schedule. But since this is it, that's um, pretty irrelevant after today. Uh, each hospital's budget information is also on our website, and that's linked as well. And then there's a link to provide public comment, or it can also be emailed to Christina McLaughlin. Just a quick word about the role of the um, board in this very complex process. The approach of the board is to establish broad parameters for hospital budgets, and that includes net patient revenue, including the aggregate amount, the rate of growth in net patient revenue, and it also includes, for the last couple of years, the board has provided an allowance for eligible health care reform investments. And then in terms of rates, um, it's an, the, what the board uh, decides on is an overall rate increase or decrease um, charged to payers. The board doesn't set individual salaries. It doesn't set um, wages. It doesn't set charges or prices for individual hospital services. That's really the role of each hospital's leadership, but rather the board engages in broader decision making around hospital budgets. So I'll turn it over to Susan at this point to talk about the public comment that we've received today. Yes, thank you, Pat. Uh, to date, we have received over 350 comments. The vast majority of those have been related to the nurses contract at University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, we have shared all of those comments with the board and they have read them. And I just will reiterate that open comment is until September 10th. And you can do that either by emailing us, calling Christina, at our main line or um, electronically, as I said, emailing. And that's 
That's the update on the public comments. I'll turn it back to you, Chairman. Thank you, Susan. At this time, I'd ask all, anyone who's going to testify, Mom Scott, if they could raise their right hand, and the court reporter will swear to that. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Paris, whenever you're ready, take it away. We're ready. And can everyone hear me? Yes. Back? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and the rest of the Economic Care Board, uh, for the opportunity to uh, come up and testify to tell our story uh, about what we're doing in Windsor and Woodstock and, and Hanover. Uh, it's more than uh, just presenting our, I think our, our budget, our financial performance. It's uh, telling our story about what we're doing in the community. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my team up here. Uh, to my far left is Wendy Fielding, who is the Vice President of Financial Planning uh, for Dr. Hitchcock Health, which is the health system uh, that uh, Montes County Hospital and Health Center is part of. To my immediate left is Teresa Tabor, who is uh, our controller. And to my right, uh, Dave Sandel. Many of you have had long histories with Dave. I'm thrilled to have him on my team. Most days. <laughs> so we will, we will uh, uh, stick to the uh, agenda and, and the questions uh, that, that were posed by the board. Uh, last year, our, our discussion, I think, went far afield and also uh, uh, was quite long, knowing that we we're the 13th of 14 hospitals to present. Uh, I pledge to not take quite as long as last year, knowing that that is a low bar. So, we're right into our overview and our mission uh, is to improve the lives of those we serve. A quick comment on that picture. That is a rehabilitation patient in our vector gate training system. Uh, this was a significant uh, investment for us as we uh, renovated our rehab a, a couple years back. And uh, one, it's one of only a couple systems in Northern New England that allows us to help stroke patients and multi-trauma patients learn how to walk again. Our org chart, as you can see up top, is Dr. Fishcock Health, uh, our health system, of which we are, uh, we are a system member, consisting of Dr. Fishcock Medical Center in Lebanon, which is our tertiary quaternary care, our AMC, uh, Alice Peck Day Hospital, the Critical Access Hospital in Lebanon, New Hampshire, uh, us, the Wizard Hospital for, uh, Corporation, I've always known as Mother Stepping, uh, Visiting Nurse and Hospice uh, of Vermont, New Hampshire, is a recent uh, member of the health system there in uh, White River Junction, and Cheshire Medical Center down in Keene, uh, New Hampshire, which is uh, a, a medical center that the health system is setting up as kind of the in-between center, not quite an academic center, more than a critical access hospital, added capacity for those folks that are too sick for critical access, not, uh, but don't require the level of care at uh, Dr. Fishcock. And then uh, we have to squeeze in uh, New London Hospital as well in London, New Hampshire, also a critical access hospital. And uh, just a quick point, Historic Homes of Renegade is, is our assisted living community in, in downtown Windsor. So on those valuable assets, I show this slide at every presentation I give. Um, regardless of the audience, it's our 460 employees and 192 volunteers spread across our three clinical sites, which is Windsor, Woodstock, otherwise known as the Ottawa Health Center, where we have primary care, pediatrics, and ancillary services such as physical therapy, and Hanover, New Hampshire, where we have an ophthalmology and optometry practice. Since our DHH affiliation in July of 2014, we've had uh, over 6,000 referrals for post-acute as well as acute rehabilitation patients uh, down to Windsor. In that time, we have uh, well over, at this point, 1,600 admissions for post-acute care to our swimming and acute rehab units, averaging somewhere between five and 600 admissions a year from Dartmouth Hitchcock. And a quick note on that, that, that really is one of our strongest niches within uh, the system. Uh, we're able to decompress Dartmouth Hitchcock, some of their, and we are, I think, known in the system as taking their sickest post-acute patients. We have a robust hospitals program that allows us to take all of those folks year after year, and that frees up tertiary and quaternary care beds uh, at Dartmouth Hitchcock. In 2018, we've been pretty busy. Our average daily census has been about 22 on the swimming and acute unit, and about 8.5 on the acute rehab. Uh, oftentimes, all 35 beds in the hospital are 
We uh, view ourselves as the test kitchen for all things integration with DHH, Dr. Fishbop Pellet. Uh, there is a, uh, a wing of our hospital that uh, has not engaged in uh, ways to uh, manage expense to increase service line activity uh, and otherwise try to benefit from being part of a larger health system, which I uh, to editorialize a little bit, I, I think it's uh, really challenging as a critical access hospital in rural northern New England to not be part of a larger health system, and I'll get into uh, reasons why I think that soon. But we've integrated our, our finance teams. Uh, we've uh, done a lot of work in supply chain and materials management. I think Dave will comment on uh, a, a few of the uh, real significant uh, savings that uh, we've attained by doing that. Uh, we've uh, integrated our pharmacy. We're part of a regional lab service uh, with DHH as well. All of our radiology is managed through uh, Dr. Fishcock uh, as well. That was a recent change uh, as of January of this year. We're part of the System Credentials Committee, or I sit on the System Credentials Committee for Dr. Fishcock Health. So we have we are moving toward one medical staff for DH Lebanon and all the member uh, partners. The hope is that at, at some point. Uh, get to a time where physicians, other providers, nurses can move throughout the system freely to fill holes in staffing when needed um, and help hopefully ease some of the workforce stresses that I'll talk about in a moment. We uh, have coordinated all of our specialty service lines. I've got a slide um, coming up uh, which will exhibit that. And uh, we're involved with system-wide strategic planning. Uh, the, the health system at large is uh, undergoing a, I would say, a robust and prolonged um, strategic planning process, and I, I call that a who, uh, really a who does what and where within within the system. Um, we feel pretty uh, strongly that uh, we are fulfilling the roles that DH uh, DHH would like us uh, to be doing. Uh, that said, I think some of the other partner hospitals or affiliate hospitals are, are having a little bit more of a, of a struggle. Um, when Dave and I were uh, up here a few months ago to talk about critical access hospitals, we, we shared some of our sentiment around uh, the, the, the challenge of the boom-bust cycle of small hospital uh, finance and, and, and budgeting. And if any of you recall, we, we talked about you know, the glory days when you have a few orthopedic surgeons doing a ton of cases and your bottom line looks great, but eventually, uh, those folks get tired of taking a call every other night and they bail and the finances have a tendency to, to crater after that. We have consciously moved away from that model um, in the last number of years. Part of it was, uh, uh, you know, our role within Dharma Fishcock Health uh, being 20, 25 minutes down the road from an academic center, you know, we really don't need to have a, a neurosurgery program or even uh, we, we've gone to that orthopedic program over the last few years um, as well. And what that has done is put pressure on us and the management team to make sure that we can still keep the lights on, doors open, pay the bills by not having those high reimbursed specialty services. So our current service lines are listed there. Everything you see in red font are services that we're able to provide because of our affiliation with Dr. Fitchcock Health. Uh, I'll point out cardiology as an example because that is a brand new service line brought on uh, over, the, over the summer. Uh, we have either the volume or the deep pockets to support a full-time cardiologist, or really even a half-time cardiologist. We're, we're a small community, but we identified a need based on the number of patients from our, uh, our our Windsor Health Service area, just by studying zip codes, all of the folks that go up to get cardiology care at DH, uh, we identified the need for day, day and a half of cardiology services. And by working with DH, we're able to get one of their cardiologists to come down uh, a day a week, and that's been a uh, uh, it's been a great addition to our services. But everything from pathology through GI to our telehealth programs in emergency medicine and psychiatry, uh, we're able to pursue those because we have, uh, again, we're part of the affiliation. So I'm, I'm often asked what keeps me up at night, and I would say last night was, was no exception. It's workforce. Um, and it's not just uh, MDs and nursing. We often think of traveling nurses, but we have travelers in our tech positions, lab techs, radiology techs, respiratory therapy. Uh, these are mission-critical positions uh, where we currently have travelers 
<coughs> high dependence, uh, high age dependence on locums providers, um, uh, both in nursing and physician roles. Uh, and I, I, I put some DH data up there just to emphasize the, the stress uh, of our region and really more than New England around workforce issues. DH has at least 700 vacancies uh, right now throughout the institution. We have about 40 plus, but that roughly represents about 10% of the needed workforce at, at both institutions that I know that other uh, partner hospitals uh, uh, really struggle uh, as well. So, I'll get into a little bit more of why I think we're having uh, the, the acuity of the workforce issues ha has come about, and I'll get to that in, in a few minutes, but this is what keeps me up. This is what dominates our discussions on the senior leadership level on a, on a daily basis. And as it is, just to, to bear that out, our traveler costs have increased from about 275000 in fiscal year 17 uh, to a projected total of $1.2 million for fiscal year 18. That hurts. Um, drilling down a little bit deeper into the workforces are uh, our issues with primary care. We've had a significant amount of uh, provider turnover over the last five years. Uh, I, I dug a little bit deeper with uh, digging into the primary care literature, and uh, some recent studies have shown that the average length of, of your first primary care job out of training is about three to five years. The, the, the days of moving to a community, new, to a community, hanging out a shingle and practicing for 20 to 30 years, at least in our neck of the woods, um, that, has, that has passed. Looking at ACGME, that's the American College of Graduate Medical Education, uh, survey data for new residency graduates and where they want to go work. Uh, this is a survey data that's published every year, shows the, the vast majority prefer urban suburban practices with a population base greater than 100,000. That certainly is not uh, Windsor or Wood stuff. Um, we suffer with trailing partner or spouse stresses when relocating to rural areas. We, we run into a situation where the, um, the where one partner loves the job, loves the area, but is wondering where their partner or spouse is going to work, whether they be an attorney or an engineer. We have a little bit of a buffer because of our uh, close location with uh, Dark Hitchcock and Hanover Lebanon region. We have a, a a little bit more industry than some of our colleague critical access hospitals, but it still remains a stress. It was a stress when I did all the hospitals recruiting for Dr. Hitchcock as well. And then we're dealing with physician provider burnout, um, uh, like all of our hospitals across the state and uh, across the nation. Uh, the, the electronic medical record and clerical workload are turning trainees away from primary care. Uh, other hospital issues are you know, the, the grab bag of financial and operational uncertainty. As far as the ACO, the all care model, we are, we've been in Medicaid for 18. We we're, uh, were the first hospital to sign our contract to go into Medicare and Medicaid and uh, the Blue Cross and Shield programs for 19, so we're full risk. We uh, had a little risk creep, um, and I'll explain that. When we, uh, none of this data was, was available for our budget submission, but as the summer uh, progressed and we got more information from One Care Vermont, our estimated overall risk was only about uh, $990,000. That was the estimated maximum downside risk for entry into all three programs. Uh, uh, that seems to be creeping upward, now closer to 1.2 to 1.3 uh, million dollars, depending on which hospitals enter. As, as you all know, our risk depends on the risk of the whole system. Uh, and uh, uh, full disclosure, I'm on the board of One Care Vermont uh, as a DH appointee, so it's one of the, the founding uh, members. Uh, so depending on which hat I'm wearing, uh, I'm trying to recruit as many hospitals and practices into One Care because when I put the CEO Lana Scotty hat on, that's going to lower all of our risk. Um, if folks decide to bail on the all payer model, then the folks that have committed to it, our, our, our costs or our potential risk is just going up. Um, and I will add to that about 260 grand in, in one care fees. So as I sometimes say, we're paying, paying for the opportunity to take some risk. But we're ready. Uh, I described it to our board as this is an incoming tide. We can keep moving our beef chairs, but at some point, you got to let it wash over you. This is what's coming. And I'm a leader right as an internist in the form of primary care now. Um, 
uh, we have predictable Vermont revenue now, but because of this uh, entrance into the off care model, but we still live in a fee for service world by our Hampshire patients, which are around 30% of our business is coming from New Hampshire because we're a border hospital. So the communities of New Hampshire, Cornish, Plainfield, Meriden, Claremont, um, we get a, a fair amount of our business from them. And then, uh, uh, back to the risk uh, side of things, all of our high cost tertiary care is, is uh, uh, provided outside of our health service area. It all goes to Dr. Hitchcock uh, or to the Brattleboro Retreat. We, when we dug deep into our high utilizers, it's the folks, the, the patients that need a, a new cardiac valve or a, or a bypass or have had a, a long uh, misadventure in ICUs at other hospitals, usually uh, DH. Um, uh, or it's, uh, honestly, we identified some pediatric psychiatry needs that are, are happening down the road. Or, now, thankfully, both of those institutions uh, are generally low cost um, compared to a lot of other <coughs> academic centers across the country. Um, but we have very, uh, very little control uh, over what happens there. Um, last on my, my list of issues is really the, the, the opioid crisis. Um, I said we, maybe it's just me, um, underestimated the effect of this epidemic on our workforce. I, uh, after holding an opioid summit at, at our hospital, I believe um, uh, Springfield Hospital did, did the same for, uh, for their region, uh, I think we have just woefully underestimated um, both the effectiveness of the work that we're doing and the amount of folks that are uh, not just not really uh, contributing to society, but are just not in our workforce right now. Um, while our HSA does not have any wait lists for patients looking or, or, or addicts looking to get into recovery to get MAT, and our, our primary care doctors, if you look at the VPMS data, that's the Vermont Prescription Monitoring Service data, um, our most recent reports in over 2017, we we're actually the lowest prescribers of opioids, uh, of new opioid prescriptions in Vermont, and the second lowest uh, in, pres in new prescriptions for benzodiazepines. That's all great. No waiting list. We're not prescribing opioids, but we are still failing. And the, the beauty of pulling a summit together that has law enforcement, their management, actual uh, addicts and folks in recovery together is you get a real accurate picture of what's going on in the community. Things like Narcan parties. So having designated drivers when folks are uh, actually using uh, intravenous opioids that are not using, but they just, they're loaded up with Narcan so they can go around and provide the Narcan as needed. Hearing from first responders that are saying, we're going back to apartments and seeing, you know, 10 to 15 empty uh, Narcan delivery devices in the, in the apartment. So we, I, I, I feel like, uh, Personally, it's a failing that I missed the boat here. So I'm going to turn fiscal year uh, uh, 19, calendar year 19, into a harm reduction year. Um, and that's going to take a lot of work because all of the stakeholders in our community are not on the same page as far as risk reduction. There's still a number of folks that think, well, you're just substituting an opioid for another opioid, and we're, we're, we're just propagating, we're extending the problem. Uh, it's going to be my job to focus on harm reduction. And I think it's, those are things like needle exchanges, which I think will be a tough sell in our community. I can put, you know, pie in the sky, observed injection centers, that's probably way down the road. Uh, but uh, a real concrete uh, example of moving toward harm reduction would be uh, starting an AT in our emergency room. So folks that show up in our ED, either looking for an opioid but are in mild withdrawal, we need to have our providers giving the first or second dose of Suboxone and getting them into a community partner the next day to start therapy. Um, and that's hard. That's a, you, you, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that our, our stakeholders are not on the, on the same page. Um, um, but it's going to be a project. And I have to convince folks that, yes, we're, we're, we're exchanging their needles. But what that does is it reduces the risk of HIV, reduces the risk of Hep C. Uh, I've had a number of young patients this year in their 20s with new diagnoses of Hep C. Um, uh, because of their real use, and that's something that I think we can make an impact on. And then we have to talk about direct outreach to addicts. I'm handing off to Dave now. 
So uh, we're going to talk for a couple minutes about some of the risks, and I know you've heard a lot of this already, so um, I don't want to say I'm going to gloss over it, uh, but there are some things later in the presentation I would rather spend time on, uh, but certainly you can redirect uh, questions or even now as far as I'm concerned. Um, so risk, well, we, uh, we signed up for um, the three risk programs, uh, but we did not have any numbers uh, at the time of uh, submitting our budget at the beginning of July to you folks. And so uh, by, that by itself was fairly risky. Now we threw in about $250,000 of potential reserves uh, in, in, in our budget, uh, and plus the $70,000 uh, that we are carrying currently for our Medicaid risk now. Um, we estimate that our additional risk that is not covered in the budget we submitted to you is somewhere between $100,000 and $500,000 as the, the needle continues to move during the course of the summer. Um, our biggest concern is we have a small N. We don't have a lot of covered lives, and so taking risk on 4,000 lives is probably not an actuarial decision so uh, but uh, we're going to make our best efforts and uh, the other issue that's hanging up there uh, relative to the ACO is that the critical access hospital cost settlement uh, piece has not been ironed out yet I think there's a theory uh, to get through the first year that I, I think is valid and will work but the uh, data coming from CMS uh, that's been tested uh, recently with another facility has not uh, been even close to accurate so there's some consternation there and uh, likely to uh, cause some additional issues going into year two, which I'll be happy to elaborate on later if you'd like me to. Staffing recruitment, uh, Joe has already talked about that. And then generally, as a small institution, uh, we, we have a small end. We manage a small end. So when we have uh, you know, 13 visits to the ER a day, uh, one or two visits starts to change uh, our metrics pretty significantly. Um, you know, our average daily census on med surge and swing is 22. Um, it doesn't take much. Uh, two patients is 10%. And so we really, on a daily basis, struggle with managing staffing uh, to accommodate the current volume. And then uncontrollable inflation, uh, pharmacy, and, and those things, which you've heard in other presentations, for sure. Uh, one of the things that we've really struggled with the last few years, and I think we've done it very well, I think the results have been pretty good, is trying to manage uh, dartmouth Fishcock health expectations of your uh, member hospitals, um, our needs uh, for our community and our uh, employees, getting ourselves ready for ACO and all-payer model, and at the same time trying to accommodate uh, your, your desires for our performance. And, and so try, and none of those things line up, by the way. They're all different. So we're trying to find ways to uh, mitigate the differences and, and try to serve, in this case, four masters. Uh, we're also bumping up against nursing home Medicaid census limits. We're, uh, as, a, as the largest uh, sub Q recipient from Dartmouth, uh, we're having a number of patients who are uh, unable to get into a nursing home in Vermont or New Hampshire. Uh, and, uh, and many of the for-profit nursing homes are now capping the percentage of Medicaid uh, beneficiaries that they will have in their facility, which causes a backup within the acute and subacute settings. Dartmouth Hitchcock provider staffing, uh, as Joe referenced earlier, uh, you know, we've had a reshuffling of the deck for services throughout the system. Uh, some of that was positive, some of that was negative, but ultimately uh, the tertiary uh, facility needs to be adequately staffed. So at the end of the day, if, uh, if they fall short in cardiology, for example, um, our day, a week of cardiology could be at risk because it's most important uh, that the uh, tertiary facility uh, maintain the level of quality and uh, staffing that they need. Uh, we have the individual mandate. Uh, I think we talked about that in the Blue Cross uh, uh, meetings and, uh, and the ongoing increase of out-of-pockets for, for uh, insured patients. I'm, all, I'm always, and I mentioned this in April when we were here, I'm always concerned that other operating revenues is, is a growing percentage as a contributor to the bottom line. 340B has talked about being limited or moved 
every single year. Uh, meaningful use uh, funding. We have about one more significant payment coming uh, uh, for Medicaid on that, and then we're kind of done. Uh, that's going away, and, and that's been a couple hundred thousand a year. Uh, grant funding, as we all know, is always at risk and has always been at risk. So uh, we try to use grant funding uh, to support uh, many of the initiatives that we've been doing before, all payer model and the ACO. Uh, but uh, we're finding that more and more necessary to provide those services that aren't reimbursed in any way, shape, or form. Um, opportunity. Uh, so this is probably something you're probably not going to be too happy to hear from me. Um, we're doing a capacity study in, at Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, and I think it's, it's, a great, it's a great thing. And we're looking at capacity. As it relates to Mount Scutney, we're looking at primary care, operating room, and inpatient uh, as potential avenues of, of capacity that we could offer to the system. The good news is that generally that is bringing in the dollars that are going to out-of-state providers uh, into Vermont or back into Vermont. Um, operating room in particular, it, we have a great deal of capacity. On the inpatient side, it's, it's maybe one or two patients at a time. It's about what we can uh, effectively manage. In primary care, as we continue to operationally address primary care and, and get back to a stable place in that program, um, there's probably some capacity there. Unfortunately, all of that leads to increased revenue. Now, from my thinking, uh, and, and we talked about this in April when we were here, uh, I'm, I'm super concerned about our pricing levels, and uh, this would provide some opportunity pulling some money in from some other places, uh, meaning over the line, across the river, that we may have an opportunity to do some price adjustments in the future. Um, Ongoing integration efforts. Uh, we have, uh, as an affiliate member of hospital of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, we essentially get Dartmouth's discount. There's tiered discount levels with GPOs. And for much of what we do, uh, because we are a member hospital and essentially owned by uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, we are getting the maximum discount on, on most supplies and pharmaceuticals. Uh, what we've really pushed this year is taking advantage of group buys for uh, capital product, and I'll just give you a couple quick examples. Uh, we bought a FACO emulsifier. We had to replace our, uh, our uh, the unit we had. Uh, normally, uh, the, the market is about 120,000 for that item. Uh, I beat them down to about 110, and then we uh, had gotten a step into the discussion, and the price dropped down to 85. So, uh, fairly significant gains on a lot of capital equipment because of that relationship. And then uh, regional service pricing, one of the things we're looking at is where's not only the best cost from an expense perspective to offer services within the system, but also what's the reimbursement cost? Where's the best place to have that, uh, that patient reside? And so those are some opportunities that we're looking at currently with Dartmouth Hitch Hitchcock. The, uh, this, this next item I'm going to get to a little bit later, uh, and this, if I'm going to editorialize on anything, it on this particular subject. Um, it's, it's my hobby horse uh, um, subject for the moment. And uh, we, we are part of a buying group uh, through NIA that Dartmouth has, has led for a number of years. They include member hospitals as well as other regional hospitals. They have no real affiliation with Dartmouth. And they access the, the buying group. We build uh, the overall spend to increase discounts for everybody from Dartmouth on down. And uh, a few years ago, we get uh, much of our benefits uh, through that. Um, I broke from the herd, and I moved all of our mail order for our pharmacies, uh, pharmacy uh, benefit for our employees to uh, a 340 d mail order model, which is the only one in the year doing it. And we saved about $100,000 a year, year in, year out. So it's been a couple of years. This year, in going through our renewal process, which we're actively involved in as I sit here, um, I really pushed hard to uh, change PDMs for the entire group and, uh, and establish our own formulary. And I'll get to why I pushed on that later, but we estimate that that's going to be another $100,000 uh, coming off uh, benefits for the, the upcoming year. Uh, additionally, we've got a little small area of opportunity, about 75000 to uh, maximize our 340B benefit 
uh, within the four walls of medication to administer to patients. And that is really the last area uh, that we have not maxed out, and we'll be working on that. Uh, we just started, actually. <coughs> Next issue is access, and this slide um, requires some explanation. Um, in general internal medicine, uh, we have the wrong kind of access. We have a shortage of what I call panel-level providers, so uh, doctors, nurse practitioners who can manage panels of patients in the classic primary care physician model. We are still rebuilding after a significant exodus over the last few years. We're getting close. I think we're one or two providers away um, from uh, getting our staffing to where it needs to be. But that WL is, it is a wait list. If you are a, uh, a, a new patient, uh, never been seen uh, by anyone in the last company uh, system previously, if you're not an employee, an employee family, a friend of the family, we have a lot of exclusions. So it's a very, it's an advantage in a small number of patients actually going on the wait list. But it, it's accurate to say that we can't get you in if you're brand new to the system and want to establish a long-term primary care relationship. Now, when I say we have the wrong kind of access, we've got plenty of same-day access. If, you, uh, if you're a, an existing patient uh, in our, our, our panel of, of folks, and you have any issue that needs to be seen, we'll get you in. Typically, it's, typically it's the same day, uh, but the latest by, by the end of the next day. In pediatrics, we have no capacity issues. We've actually added uh, some pediatric capacity in our Woodstock clinic. And in general surgery, it's the same story. And I will say that this is for um, non-urgent, non-acute referrals to general surgery. If you have a, an acute or urgent issue, we have same day access for our surgeons as well. Um, uh, there's a lot on this slide, um, and I know uh, in, the, in the budget narrative, this was a, uh, an area of investigation by, by the board. Um, so uh, I don't want to walk it back my, my real visceral response to our uh, blueprint data. Uh, I'll walk it back a little bit, but uh, we uh, don't have full confidence in the accuracy of the data that we get from the blueprint as part of our HSA profiles. Um, I've been a, a, a physician much longer than I've been an administrator. And um, the, the, the joke that I have said at some of our primary care operations meetings is, um, you know, thank God another analyst is something that no physician said ever. Um, but uh, we, 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 we measure our, uh, the quality of our care through data. And when we get a profile of our primary care practices that clearly does not have accurate de data, uh, I, I, I am then fighting an uphill battle with my providers to trust any data. And the example I'll use is when I first got to Mount Stephanie five years ago, I sat in on a meeting where I had to discuss our blueprint profile, and it said that we didn't measure the BMI of any of our primary care patients, which with our DMR, you can't, you can't walk in the door without your BMI being recorded. So there was data that we were trying to send to the blueprint, but because of IT-related issues, there was a, a, a block at the door, and we couldn't get it in. Um, and instead of uh, you know, footnoting the data in the blueprint profile, it just looks like we're, we're terrible. We're not checking BMI, we don't care, we're not doing depression screenings. Um, and, and the problem is the areas where we could identify, yes, this is accurate, we need to be active on this from a quality improvement standpoint, it just becomes that much harder because you have providers saying, again, I was one of them, who would say, well, how do I know this is uh, true? And we've got a couple other examples of that, like the Medicaid well child visits, uh, when we've done real-time chart reviews, we felt that the, da the data didn't accurately reflect what our pediatric practices were doing. Um, again, it was uh, 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 EMRs and IT issues not talking with each other. Um, but upon further uh, digging into various issues that the APN quality measures uh, did reveal, um, you know, we worked hard to improve our uh, uh, 
referral to treatment for folks that are presenting to our health center, whether it be in the clinics or in the ED, uh, with alcohol and drug dependence issues. So we initiated ESPER, which is screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment programs in both our ER and in our primary care clinics. Uh, we support a full-time LADAC, a licensed alcohol drug uh, abuse counselor. Uh, in, in our clinics as well, we have uh, grown our psychiatry practice so that we can reliably provide 30-day follow-up after discharge from mental health. Um, we uh, are now exceeding state targets through education efforts uh, directed toward the provider nursing staff uh, around controlling high blood pressure. And uh, there was a topic of a, a question from the board about the a prevalence issue around diabetes and hypertension in, in our health service area. I think that data is accurate. I think we have a lot of hypertensives and diabetics. Um, and uh, so that is why we're, we are uh, focusing resources on improving the control of those folks. And, and, and frankly, through increasing prevention efforts through 3450 advisory law to prevent the progression to actual hypertension or diabetes. Um, the uh, uh, appropriate asthma medication management. Act. I morph that into the better control of our COPD in asthma patients because I think that's a the asthma medication management quality metric is a, is uh, a little bit squishy from the from the physician standpoint. I'm not sure that's a great measure of quality. I think keeping patients out of the ED and keeping patients out of the inpatient setting is a, is a, is a better uh, measure of quality for those patients. Uh, we, we started a QI project about 18 months ago and have since reduced our ED visits and admissions for this cohort. Um, and I think that's a better metric, as I said. Um, percent, of, percent of adults with PCP self-reported, yeah, we're below the state average and it is directly related to our challenge in recruiting uh, primary care physicians. Uh, some, of the, some of that challenge in recruiting is, uh, is compensation related. Um, and I, I, I can't even blame DH like I always do <laughs> by saying we can't compete with wage pressures. Uh, I've often said that you know, DH competes with Boston for talent, uh, for especially on the physician side. And then all the hospitals around DH are competing with DH for that same pool uh, of docs. Um, but, but, it, but it's happening uh, everywhere. I, uh, in uh, discussions with a primary care doc right now, got an offer 50 grand more from a hospital in northern New Hampshire and 100 grand more in a rural area of, of Minnesota. And we, just, we just can't compete with that. Um, even if they did graduate from Dartmouth and went to Dartmouth Medical School and bleed green like a lot of our, our, our local docs do. Uh, I, I, I put the next two slides on here just as a reference. I'm not going to go through them all in the interest of, of time, which I'm sure everyone is thankful for. But the general take-home theme is that our primary care practices are, are at or exceeding uh, the quality measures in, in most uh, of these categories. And where we're off, we're not off by much, and, and focusing efforts uh, to, to get up to at least the state average, if not exceed them. One thing I will point out. With it, uh, Dave is have, focusing on pharmacy benefit managers, and I'm focusing on opioids uh, for currently. Um, our rate of overdose deaths uh, is, is simply too high. And that also helped to change my mind that uh, we were doing enough for the opioid epidemic. Again, that doesn't, that number doesn't jive with no waiting list for MAT, low opioid prescribing. I, I feel like we've hit a couple of, it, it's a little bit like black and mold, we're, we're hitting a few of them, but if folks are still dying, we need to focus on harm reduction. Yeah, and as I said, that, that's going to be a big moving forward. I'll hand it back over to Dave. So again, we provide you with the p and uh, cash flow and, and balance sheet as requested. Um, I'm sure you've looked at that ad nauseum. Um, the only highlight really on the uh, P&L would be maybe two things. One is the 756,000 was the best estimate we had for fixed payments associated with the Medicaid program for calendar year 2019, and uh, our operating margin is essentially break even. Uh, on the cash flow, um, we actually couldn't really reconcile uh, to this, and, and, and uh, and I'd be happy to, to, 
discuss with, with staff and, and whoever to, to kind of clean that up. But essentially, our, our increase or decrease in cash year to year is, is basically going to be zero uh, because it's a break even budget and our capital spending versus um, the depreciation is really not going to uh, increase uh, $4 million. Um, the balance sheet actually looks good. I'm going to have some metrics we're going to talk about uh, in, in a second but, or a couple minutes. Um, but uh, I did uh, want to respond to this. So basically, uh, looking at our total book of business, so that would include the physicians, inpatient, ER, all outpatient services, uh, where we're generating about uh, you know, three quarters of our business from Vermont and about a quarter uh, from New Hampshire. And, and so that's changing by a couple percentage points over the last few years. And uh, it's interesting when you look at a, dep at a department level for this, um, our, uh, our OR, laboratory, radiology, ophthalmology, uh, those are more like a third comes from New Hampshire and uh, two thirds comes from Vermont. Rehab, uh, inpatient rehab is starting to leave that uh, uh, two third, one third ratio and is starting to head towards closer to a 50-50. And part of that is a result of our additional census that we were able to take in uh, from our CON project we did, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, those patients were typically going to Health South down in Concord, New Hampshire, and now they're staying in the region. So I think it's, it's better for everybody involved. So expense drivers and cost containment, again, we've talked about workforce issues and the, and the primary care issues and the ACO. Uh, we, we have put a lot of uh, time into our energy initiatives. Uh, we were the first hospital in the state of Vermont to qualify for their highest award, and uh, we're in the 25th percentile uh, nationally uh, for the amount of adoption and implementation and installation of energy efficient Mechanicals and uh, much of our CON, uh, our capital investment over the next few years is routine replacement of, of uh, roof units and air handling and lighting and, and these things to continue on that track. We've done an excellent job with that. Uh, has it net us a ton of money on the bottom line? No, but we're probably saving tens of thousands of utilities a year and we've been maximizing uh, the rebates along the way. We have a great partnership uh, with Efficiency Vermont and we're looking to, to maintain that and to finish the strategic plan that we've set up for that. Um, pharmacy, again, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, group purchasing, we've talked about system integration and uh, reduction of overhead. I, I do want to talk about one thing that, so some of you folks haven't been around as long as I have, and, uh, at least in this setting. And so uh, we've done a great deal of uh, locking off of appendages. So when I arrived at the end of fiscal year 2012, uh, and my first act of duty was to announce a $4.3 million operational loss um, and then start work. Uh, you know, we, we closed the nursing home. We, we looked uh, at, at the contributions of various departments. We looked at what our mission was. We looked at who we needed to be when we grew up. And uh, we made some hard decisions. So we've done a lot of if you go back, even back to 2012-2013 uh, data, which I know you folks have, you, you would see there was uh, some very significant changes. And, and we had a number of years where our net uh, patient revenue didn't grow at all, uh, mainly because we were making some very large-scale adjustments in how we did business and what business we did. And so as part of the system integration process, again, we're, we're looking at uh, managing uh, efficiently and efficiency is getting rid of things that uh, you shouldn't be doing, uh, getting rid of waste, but it's also using the resources that you are paying for better or to a greater degree. And uh, with the large percentage of fixed costs that we have within the critical access hospital, we do have capacity in a number of departments. And in order to be efficient, it's not just cutting costs, it's also looking at how you're using the resources in total. So uh, we're, we're actively involved in that. I did want to mention the captive insurance. We're part of the captive insurance program uh, through Dartmouth. Um, we've had a cost avoidance of thirty to $70,000 a year on that program for a few years. 
years now. Uh, we also uh, initiated with them and the other member of hospitals a shadow captive stop loss for our health insurance. This has lowered premiums, has allowed us to uh, increase our attachment point. DARPA provides a, a pretty significant backstop from our attachment point of 125,000 uh, up to uh, 750,000. And then we have an umbrella uh, policy that can, uh, covers it after that. And we've had, uh, we've had this in place, this is our third year. Uh, the first two years, we were actually able to capitalize and take that benefit on the P&L as a reduction in benefits and also uh, build some reserves for the future. So that's been an excellent program and is one of the things that we should be doing as a system. Um, I've, I've kind of talked about this uh, through person. I do want to touch on standardizing. One of the things as part of our capital process and trying to leverage group buys for equipment, not just supplies and pharmaceuticals, is we're standardizing equipment. So we have a number of part-time providers, a general surgeon who works a couple days a week at Dartmouth and a couple days a week at our facility. And so what we're trying to do is, as our equipment needs to be replaced in the OR with routine replacement, uh, we're trying to adopt the technology wherever possible that's used at Dartmouth so that the docs are using the same equipment in both ORs, that the biomed folks are, are dealing with the same uh, product in both facilities, and, uh, and again, leveraging uh, their deeper discounts that we're not able to get. Uh, Joe touched on lab and rad, uh, both of these. Uh, one uh, significant thing that doesn't get talked about a lot is that with the laboratory and radiology, we're, all of our results are being stored in their system as well as our own system, whether it's a PAX image for a CT or it's a result of a lab test. And so now when we're referring patients to Dartmouth for uh, subspecialty or tertiary care, uh, those providers there are able to see the studies that we did at Mount of Scotty and not have the duplicate testing issue that we've all hated for so many years. Um, the, the benefit of this, aside from the obvious, is, is that folks are able to get care quicker because they're not waiting for another test to be ordered and having to wait for that. All of the protocols and procedures that we use within the laboratory and within our radiology suite are all Dartmouth protocols and procedures. So it's totally consistent. Uh, the quality is there, and we're getting consistent reads uh, across the system. So that's been a huge, a huge benefit. Uh, and Joe's reference shared staffing opportunities that we've talked about. Um, so here's my hobby horse subject for the day. Um, and this, is, this started as a consumer. It drove me crazy, and I've never had the opportunity to influence the change for this, and I'm, I'm on the hunt now. So there are three PBMs that control 80% of the market in the United States. And uh, PBM is a pharmacy benefit manager. And so when you sign up for Blue Cross or Harvard Pilgrim or whoever your insurer is, uh, they, they, they give uh, a formulary, and it's a package formulary. And they say, these are the drugs that are on our formulary, and our, our beneficiaries uh, you know, can only get from these. And if you go off that, um, then you need pre-authorization or you pay a copay penalty. And that would be great if the efficacy data and the cost data justified pushing people towards certain medications. But it actually doesn't. So um, I'm going to pull a little you know, Tom Cruise from the firm thing. I mean, there be uh, Crown Vicks out in the parking lot with smoke glass, probably when I'm done. But I think it's an important issue that we all need to understand. Uh, this chart here is, is basically the, the, the study we just completed a couple, uh, about a month ago. Um, out of the $500,000 in spend for, for our employees, okay, and their dependents, uh, it's about $500,000. Uh, we're projecting to save $120,000. And this is on top of the 340D leveraging of $100,000 we did a couple years ago, um, right off the top. Now, the trick of this should have been, well, how do you make sure your people are going to have better outcome? It's not just saving money. What's the outcome? So uh, this, this was entirely driven on three principles. Same outcome, less cost better outcome, same cost, and ideally, less cost, better outcome. 
And so this is all FDA, this, these are standardized data sets. And so we went through there, this, this graph uh, gives you some indication of the more the dot is to the right is the better statistical outcome for the patient. And then uh, going down on the chart, uh, the vertical axis is, you know, what's the cost? And so the goal is to push everything to the right and to the bottom. That's essentially what we're trying to do. So we, uh, and this, by the way, only affects about 19%, uh, that $120,000 of savings uh, only affects about 19 or 20% of the people who are getting coverage to us. And it only impacts about 18% of the total drugs being prescribed in our program. So it's not an insurmountable uh, item to manage. So I just provided a couple of uh, quick examples. Uh, this particular medication is an annual savings of $20,000 uh, a year by itself. There's 14 people who would potentially be impacted. And uh, so we're going to go from, uh, and I want you to understand this is, this is, if you look at these, where these dots are, there are two brands that are typically prescribed for this particular condition. Uh, notice that the efficacy is not getting any better. In other words, the, the, the generic A is not moving to the right. So people are going to have the exact same medical outcome that they would have with drugs A and B by going uh, with generic A. The difference is we're going from $57 a pill to 11 cents per pill. So the formulary that we have currently is pushing people to brand A and B. People aren't going to have the better expectation or the better result. Uh, and they're going to be paying way too much. So by changing our formulary to what's best for the patient, we're actually saving money as an organization. The patient is saving out of pocket and again with the exact same result. This other medication is actually uh, going from a branded generic, and I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, I'll explain it later if you'd like, uh, to uh, just a generic. And going from $515 a month to $10 a month, the exact same outcome, statistically speaking, at the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration results. So, so these are the things we're looking at. So I have pushed very hard uh, to get the formulary for the NIA benefit platform changed. Last, uh, last week, uh, we made some significant movement on it. Dartmouth has partnered with a PBM, Optum, which is one of the big three. But the condition was that they used the formulary that we derive from this data set. And we estimate for the system, uh, it's, it's going to be millions of dollars. Uh, and people are going to get the same or better outcome. So there's my hobby horse item for, for the, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about this later. Um, year to day reconciliation as we come down the home stretch here. Um, so we have had increased volume, and I think the thing I would like to point out uh, out of this is even though we've had increased volume, that volume is not something we have generated. We're not running boutique services, we're not pulling in some specialties, we're, we're not doing uh, things to make ourselves bigger, we're just doing a better job of being ourselves. Uh, most of the uh, volume, uh, favorable volume increases are in departments you don't market for. You don't market for your emergency room. Uh, whoever shows up, shows up. And uh, while we've had increased volume in many areas, uh, the flip side of that is that we've had a decreased commercial volume as a percentage. So Medicare is up four or five points year to date this year. Uh, and uh, Blue Cross and commercial are down four or five points this year. Medicaid is about the same, a little higher, but fairly close. And so um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big issue. We're getting bailed out a little bit this year because we had a favorable variance in our dish payment. Uh, FY19, that's being cut in half. Um, other revenue, generally, again, we've got 162000 that came in for the meaningful use EHR incentive. Uh, we've got one more payment coming in after that, and that's gone, and, and, and that's not referenced in our FY19 budget. So we've had some favorable uh, 340B experience, and, uh, and, and so we just continue to work through that. Um, our expense management, even though volume has gone up, we're off a half a percentage point from July from our expenses. So we're doing a really good job of managing our expenses, even though volume's gone up. And this goes back to our discussion about what percentage of our expenses are fixed and how much capacity do we have 
uh, within the system, or within our system. Uh, expenses, um, Joe already talked about the increasing need for travelers. Um, essentially, our traveler and local expenses has uh, quadrupled since 2016, uh, and that continues to run away from us. Uh, we are, uh, we have some variances in salaries as we try to become a little bit more market competent in our offers to people and, uh, and, and managing a, uh, some volume in a couple smaller areas. Uh, and the benefits are, are, are growing kind of commensurate with the salaries. Uh, we've done a great job of managing every expense we control. Uh, we look at FTEs every single week in senior management. We analyze every hire. Do we need this job? Can it be done part-time? Can it be done by somebody else? Uh, and that's a weekly discussion in senior management. It has been for a number of years. And then uh, um, other operating, uh, again, I'm trying to buzz through this. Uh, you know, nothing terribly exciting here. We were uh, expected because we, we uh, FY18 was uh, budgeted to be a loss of over a million dollars in operations. Uh, we were, because of the assistance we provide government by taking their sub acutes and some other folks um, that are not money makers. Um, Dartmouth and um, Mount Scotty had budgeted for an allocation payment for those services. And since we are now operating at above uh, break even, uh, we have not received any of that, and that's okay for all of us. This is uh, a, a brief history. Uh, orange is uh, what we actually did, and blue is what we thought we would do. It goes back to 2000. and. Um, you can see 2012 was my, my, my great first day of you guys just lost four million bucks. Uh, and uh, the next year was a break even in 14 and 15. There were some losses. 16, we made a few bucks. And uh, um, 17 and 18, uh, we about performed. And uh, this is a great thing. Uh, when you look at it in context, as cumulative uh, budget to actual. Um, you know, budget is uh, orange, and that's kind of how things should have grown from our uh, operating margin over time. And the blue line is what we actually did. Um, what we've done in the last uh, six years is to steady the ship. And I think, again, I'd like to you know, remind you folks, uh, you know, we, we closed um, a, a nursing home. We cut out services, got the full backs and services as part of the system allocation process. And, uh, and, and through all of that, we've kind of we've Kept, uh, kept the wheels on and uh, through a lot of adjustments. Um, when I look at us, how healthy are we? I, I looked at a couple things. One, how do we compare to other hospitals, which is the same thing that you folks do. Uh, but I also look at um, what do people from outside Vermont, uh, who are experts in the industry, what do they think? We, where do they think we are? And so we've kind of gone through s and small hospital ratings. Uh, we're actually small in the small hospital um, end. Uh, and uh, so uh, generally we're looking at about a triple B. We're a little bit low in today's cash. Some of that is related to the fact that we've been hovering basically over the last six years at a break even. And, um, and, and our CON, which we funded uh, much of that through cash. And so we've, we've done a pretty good job. Uh, if you looked at this five years ago, uh, we would have been speculative in, in almost every category. So we've done a good job of, of trying to steady the ship in the midst of all the other changes we're dealing with. Turnover, uh, we're still, turnover is improved, but we're still behind state averages and wages. We have been really working hard to make sure we hit the margin we expect so that we can give merit and market increases to our staff who went without for many, many years. And even when they got, they didn't get very much. Um, we look pretty good on adjusted uh, FTEs uh, and uh, based on adjusted, uh, adjusted uh, admissions or discharge. Um, our occupied bed looks good. Days cash, we're a little bit below the state average, but we're closing the gap. Our Asia plant looks pretty good. Part of that is our, our, our recently closed out CON. And, uh, and we've done all this uh, weathering all the integration changes and positioning ourselves for ACO and all pair. Um, uh, I keep harping on this because uh, I like to drive Joe crazy every day. Um, we're price, we're, we're, our prices need work. I've talked about this in last year's hearing. I talked about it in April. 
and uh, I really wanted to submit a 2% or less price increase this year, and we just we just couldn't make the dog bark. We just couldn't do it. Uh, we and then we're finding out that there was a problem under reserve for VCO as well. But with our cuts in dish, we lost uh, almost 400,000 in our dish payment. Uh, year to year, and uh, the changes in the payer mix, and putting aside uh, 250 for a reserve, which is proving to be uh, inadequate, uh, there was no way I could I could uh, do less than what we did for the 2.94 percent average. So I'm very sensitive to this. I obsess about this. The Act 53 data comes out, and I don't show up for work for three days. Um, this, as a consumer and a taxpayer, this is really what I want to work on this next year. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is to leverage every opportunity we have, uh, which I do every day anyways, but uh, we really need to lower our prices. And uh, that's really important uh, for, for everybody involved. I'll look through these uh, slides with some haste. Uh, we were asked to comment on our response to whether community health needs assessment. Uh, we are in the process of, of analyzing the data from our 2018 needs assessment. And one of the reasons uh, it's taking a little bit longer is we made a concerted effort, effort when we started the process this year to reach more people. I believe we had around somewhere between three and 400 community responses in our 2015 uh, health needs assessment, uh, but we uh, hit social media, we hit 4th of July parades, uh, general stores, uh, post offices to hand out our uh, the surveys, and we got uh, about 1,100 uh, responses to the survey uh, at this point. But the things that we did in response to our 2015 uh, survey uh, are substantial. Uh, Many of you uh, may know uh, Jill Lord, who's my director of community health. She's uh, legendary in, in the state of Vermont, uh, with all the work that she has done. Uh, so uh, we can see with our uh, the number one uh, need identified was around alcohol and drug misuse, including heroin use and pain meds. Uh, a, a long list of, of current and ongoing activities, and we included a bullet at the bottom that is the overall cost of the program, and I'll explain uh, uh, that of, as we move through the survey of response. Um, the, all of our work as far as access to mental health, which was uh, number two uh, issue of, of highest concern, and part of that included uh, hiring a uh, psychiatrist and embedding that person in our PCMH. Our access to dental care continues to be a significant problem for us. Windsor doesn't have a dentist. Um, so we provide vouchers to go elsewhere. We uh, beg and plead with area dentists to take our, our, our patients. We have made significant interventions in the school, uh, applying uh, fluoride and sealants uh, directly to the kids uh, while they're there. Um, but largely, we're giving patients vouchers and begging dentists to, to provide care. It's a huge issue I've offered to uh, pay and highly subsidized practice to attract a, a new trainee. I'm hoping that some of the changes in Vermont statute around um, uh, uh, dental assistance to provide more work in the community will help us. Um, but I think it's a, uh, it can be a challenging community of providers. Um, and our, our payer mix um, and has been tough to attract dentists. Uh, Access to affordable health insurance, cost of, of drugs. We have uh, a, high, a very productive uh, uh, person in our, our CH, on our CHT teams whose only job is to get people onto uh, the exchanges, to get people onto Medicaid, to we've brought in for our, our employees uh, the Working Bridges program, which is a Grand United Way program to, to help folks navigate a, a little bit of the, the healthcare maze of, uh, uh, insurance as well as affordability. Uh, nutritional, uh, nutrition access to affordable food. We were early adopters and implementers of 3450. Uh, reached over 300 uh, children in schools and uh, over 1,000 adults in our community uh, around uh, prevention activities. We uh, wrote and, and uh, distributed a cookbook, uh, which was fantastic. 
Uh, a, a quick note I do want to make on this slide is Rachel's Kitchen, which uh, served free community breakfasts, uh, which we had helped support over the years, um, suddenly uh, closed. Uh, sort of left breakfast on a Friday, sent a note to the community saying, we can't afford to keep this going. Uh, so we're closing. This was right as school was laying out uh, for the summer. Uh, so uh, we stepped in and uh, helped raise money, provided funds, and had Rachel's Kitchen uh, back up and running on, on Monday morning. We also provide um, uh, lunches uh, at three different sites around Windsor uh, over the summer, uh, basically packing backpacks and, and serving lunches for uh, kids that uh, wouldn't otherwise have access to reliable uh, meals during the day when school gets up. And uh, this builds on the last slide, our work with 3450 and uh, yeah, adopted uh, working in Plymouth Rise Vermont uh, as, as part of our, our work there. And I know that Rise Vermont is really part, a vital part of the population health on our, of, of our ACO. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, Windsor is a community that has some uh, socioeconomic stresses. And it's not just the, the opioid issue. Uh, like a lot of northern New England towns, when a you know, large industry closes, it becomes a little bit more hard scrabble over time. Um, but thanks to Jill's good work, uh, we provide a lot of services and support a lot of services uh, uh, in our community. Access to primary care continues to be a, a big problem for us. Despite our challenges, we did get redesignated as a level three PCMH. Uh, I recruit every day uh, for primary care. We developed a quality dashboard that is posted on our, our internet, uh, which allows real-time recording of, of uh, and, and display of data around our access, around our patient satisfaction with our primary care teams. Um, we are working through our list of high-risk and very high-risk complex chronic patients uh, on our, uh, of our attributed lives that are in Medicaid now. We'll be doing the same for Medicare, Medicaid, and CPS patients for next year. Uh, we coordinate, uh, and, uh, as part of our work in the HSA, uh, multiple meetings monthly with our uh, both our designated agencies and other supporting agencies in the community to help provide care for some of these more complex folks. And our volunteers drove over 15,000 miles um, in uh, 2017 to get patients to their uh, medical appointments, whether it be Bonaspati or Dr. Hitchcock. Uh, or transporting around our free clinic. Uh, population community health uh, is really our, our number one concern at Plymouth Stepney. Uh, we uh, provide leadership for a, uh, a number of organizations uh, locally, uh, as listed there. Um, if there is if there's a need, we, we act to fill it. Um, uh, if anything, I sometimes have to put the brakes on, on, on Jill Ward uh, with her grant writing uh, and, and proposals because we oftentimes don't have the bandwidth to uh, actually operationalize what we're promising and we're going to, to do. But that's, that's a good problem to have. I'd rather be deeply embedded and, and working along those lines. So a, a summary of those costs, if you add all that up, it's about $1.5 million. And about 900,000 of that is grant, donation, and gift supported, and 600,000 plus is direct support from the hospital, whether that be covering of salaries, benefits, grant you name it. Can't underestimate the value of grant support and, and the work that we do in the community. Some of our hospital investments in, in health reform. Uh, I think we were asked to report on what was listed as a reform investment in 2016, and that was around our addition of psychiatry um, services at our hospital. We had a contracted relationship with a, a nurse practitioner that, frankly, when I looked at it from a quality perspective, it was real maintenance and not real care of our patients with psychiatric needs. Um, so we, we uh, hired a full-time psychiatrist and embedded that person in the plan. Uh, in preparation for 18, our engagement with Medicaid, and in 19, all three risk programs. Um, I, my my uh, non-clinical background, uh, my uh, physi uh, physician work is in care management. When I was at Dr. Fishcock, I was a medical director of care management, um, which uh, 
for lack of a better description, is the way we um, support and move patients through a system, pre-hospital care, hospital care, post-hospital care. Um, that also involves some contracting with payers, um, some arguing with payers about the level of service and care we're providing, kind of the dirty job that no one wants to do. Um, but I'm a firm believer that the, 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 the build out of nursing and care management resources is how we move the needle from a population health standpoint. Um, so we are, uh, we call this a one care analyst, but we are going to be hiring um, a, we're going to call it accountable care uh, analyst to look at the mountain of data that we do get from one care uh, that I believe is, is uh, valid as well as reliable. Um, we are uh, hiring a social worker uh, into, into a bed in primary care. We've also, uh, we have hired a quality uh, analyst, uh, a nurse informaticist to help our nurses better use the EMR as uh, a tool to help manage our, our complex and chronically ill patients. Uh, we're uh, covering half of our, uh, the, the compensation for a C, uh, community health team nurse manager. Uh, and we have our one care fees, but all of those positions uh, listed above in that, in, in that graph is uh, in that table, excuse me, uh, are new. And that's a new, new cost, new position in the hospital. The investments that I think we needed to make to get ready for you know, the world of, of pretty significant downside risk. If, you know, if our downside risk is 1.3 million on a break even budget, we need to make sure that we're prepared for it. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the people investments um, on that were uh, in that prior table. Uh, we also support uh, FTE of uh, a couple positions for our one care Vermont QI efforts. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had an initial focus on COPD patients, and, and we actually worked hard to reduce readmissions, uh, all cause acute to acute readmissions. Uh, uh, that should be high complexity patients, not all high patients, although I guess we're moving into that world uh, in Vermont as well, uh, to less than 10%, which is a pretty remarkable readmission rate. Um, and uh, our, the, the care of our patients with CS CHF was uh, identified as uh, an area uh, needed for quality improvement, so we've invested in the 0.2 FTE cardiology support from DH for all the good start there. And I'll hand back to Dave for fly through these last few. I do want to make uh, one point that I, I missed in, in going on my hobby horse for a couple minutes, and that is that one of the reasons that we're doing this with our employee benefit is if it's good enough for our employees and effective enough for our employees, maybe it's something we can roll out to some of the other panels of patients that our docs are managing, because our docs are managing the care of many of our employees and their uh, dependents. So, you know, if we can if we can make this thing work, then I don't know why we would be pushing that towards any other panel of patients, whether it's all pair model, uh, accountable care, the Medicaid program. I don't know why this wouldn't be applicable uh, to virtually every patient within the Vermont system. So, uh, relative to capital, this is going to be the most uh, boring thing ever. We don't have a single sexy item in uh, FY19 at all. We have nothing. It's rooftop units, uh, air handling, hot water exchange. I mean, it's just the mechanical stuff that should have been done routinely over the last 25 years. Uh, our, our, our COO is sitting in the back, and he and I have the most boring discussions about what we're investing in because there's nothing. It's everything in our, literally every item that is in our capital budget for 2019 is routine replacement. Um, so uh, there's no building projects, there's, there's no new machine that goes ping in the OR, it's all replacement of existing mechanicals and equipment. Uh, there is no CON, uh, there's no material change to scope since we submitted the budget. Uh, we've had to move a couple items up because we had a rooftop unit uh, blow up uh, two weeks ago, so we're doing that one early. Um, and this is basically how it breaks out. Building improvement, land improvement, major movable land improvement is really parking lot management because that's been, uh, uh, we've thrown very little resources at that the last several years. So, um, and so we have about $700,000 we're not gonna get to in capital we anticipate to get to this year, it's gonna roll into next year. Um, basically our issue is we have bandwidth. We, we, we 
can only get so many projects and so many purchases done with with our limited uh, staffing. So, um, but again, uh, fairly fairly boring discussion here. Long range uh, financial outlook. Uh, we really need to uh, work on our wages a bit. Uh, we need to maintain our lean infrastructure. Um, we're trying to keep the capital spending uh, so we keep our agent plan as flat as possible. Uh, we need to continue to work with the standardization programs to maximize discounts to Dartmouth. Uh, we're going to continue to do uh, effective expense management and uh, we're going to try to work on that fixed expense uh, percentage by using current available resources differently. Uh, we'll continue to work with DH integration uh, on as many things as we can. And, and again, uh, as I harp on this issue, we need to reduce pricing. Uh, how does this relate to the all-payer model and the ACO? Um, our current management style, uh, and I'm saying that over the last five or six years, incremental, consistent change over time. That makes us more and more predictable as time goes on. Uh, we're, we're no longer dealing with yesterday's crisis. We're now working on things we've got to do today and looking to tomorrow. Uh, positioning ourselves with people plan and procedures to improve access costs and quality, and, uh, and really working on some of that controllable inflation. Uh, and to reduce that, we're we'll trying to keep ourselves in line, our inflation in line with uh, uh, the all pair model 3.5% growth over time. And, that's going to be difficult when you look at the, the percentage of, of salaries and benefits as a percentage of our expenses and knowing what the market is, uh, is, is forcing us to move to. And then uh, maintain some cash positions to go through the uncertainty of the ACO and the all payer model. Uh, budget compliance, uh, this is easy, we were compliant. Um, and, and I did want to uh, maybe do something I haven't done in uh, my 20 years of uh, oversight here in the state of Vermont. Um, so I think we put it together a pretty good budget. Uh, we really challenged ourselves, we pushed ourselves, and I think we put together a good budget. If there were two disappointments in the entire budget process, and this is uh, not considering any of your concerns, uh, as, as a CFO, a taxpayer, and consumer, uh, I would have liked to have had a, a, the smallest rate increase possible. And I challenged Teresa and some of our other folks, let's go back and take a look at that. Let's rerun that data. Uh, because that was really, it's really something I want to bend that curve on. Uh, the other piece of it is that we, we have uh, dealt with an incredible amount of change. This is the third CEO I've had in the five years I've been there. Dartmouth has had leadership changes. There's been strategic changes uh, through the entire system. Um, and, and we've kind of stuck to the knitting, done the things we need to do for those external groups. But you know, what do we need to do internally? How do we manage ourselves so we don't need to be I know our net patient service revenue growth is greater than what you would have uh, liked to have seen from us. But when I look at things like uh, the slight change in the payer mix, and, and I look at our dish being cut in more than half, and, and some of these other things, there's your percentage point and a half, two points that we added. Um, that, that's what it accounts for. I can, I can point to specific issues. I would like you to approve our budget as submitted, obviously. I would like to not do a bunch of rework and, and reset for October 1st. Um, but I would also uh, promise you, as an individual, and Joe and I have talked about this, this is, I'm not spraying this on him, um, you know, calling it audible at the line of scrimmage. But I feel like because we've been doing incremental change consistent over time, and every week that goes by, we're a little bit more predictable. Every week that goes by, we're getting to things we need to be getting to that we couldn't get to for five years. Um, I will manage to that margin. I, if that means price decreases in November, I will do whatever it takes to, to, to keep us with a break-even margin uh, and, and to do the best I can for everybody involved. And uh, uh, my moral and ethical compass is, is far more stringent upon me than anything you're going to ever dish out. And, uh, and Joe and I have talked about this. These are things we, that should have been done years ago. We're at a place, we've gotten stable, we're a little bit more predictable, and, and we're, we're willing to commit to working to that end. So 
Uh, right now, we're, we, uh, we're asked to do an update on, uh, on our projection for FY18. We submitted a budget for $330,000. Well, July came in, which is usually a very slow month, and we actually had a really good month. Uh, so now my projection sitting here is more like $500,000. Well, I looked at the stats yesterday uh, for a month to date in, in, in August, and guess what? We're having another good month in August. So um, I don't know that the 500,000 is, is a good estimate. It might be a little bit higher than that. Uh, the point being, um, our, our continued improvement in financial performance is what's going to give us the ability to go back and deal with the pricing issues and to deal with some of these things. And I would prefer to manage that on an ongoing fluid basis as opposed to be regimented to an annual discussion about it. I would like the flexibility to say I'm cutting my lab prices by 5% because I can and still make my financial goals. So for whatever that's worth. Thank you. That's it. Um, a little shorter than last year. <laughs> goal, goal met. Well, I just, just the presentation part is shorter. So we're going to start our questions with uh, Robin Lund. Robin? Uh, I had a couple questions around um, the health care reform investments. It looked to me in your submission that you had not requested the point four NPR, but I see from your slides that you clearly have point four worth of investments that are new um, and quite frankly easily approvable. So I was wondering if you could speak to that and if you'd be willing to make that request. So uh, when uh, Kevin Donovan was here uh, as CEO, we had our I think, first year of off-ramps, I think we called them back then in the old days, and uh, we really felt like many of these healthcare reform investments are things we just need to be doing, and because we're so small, a lot of those investments were like 0.2 FTE. Yeah. They, they were just, it was really hard, to, it was harder to figure out what was associated with that yeah. than just doing it and putting it in the budget. So basically, other than psychiatry in 2016, we have made every reform into our budget. Much of what uh, we're doing with the community health needs assessment has been baked in our budget for years. So we're, we're highlighting that because you asked a specific question. Um, but these are things we need to do regardless of the point four, or we just need to be doing them. Uh, we need to have data, and we need to have data that's usable and can be disseminated to providers to make changes. We need to do these things. So I, personally, I don't care what you call it, um, I, but these are things we, we really need to do. And, and a couple of them, we've already, we've already hired the staff to people, because we just need to do it. We're not getting to it, and it's important. I appreciate that philosophy, and certainly that's uh, where we would want all hospitals to be. Uh, but quite frankly, your NPR is high, so it helps you and it helps us. So um, I think it would what we may request that you fill out the form uh, if other board members are on that same page with me. Um, let's see. I, I think actually that's my only question. So I'll pass it to Tom. You never know how close you get to this thing. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, being a new board member, I, uh, before we started the budget process, I was able to tour most of the uh, hospitals in the northern tier, and I'm heading south when this process is over. I look forward to uh, coming to your operation and, and spending a day with you if I could. A um, couple quick questions. Um, I'm <clears throat> looking at your uh, uh, Medicaid projection for uh, 2019, and um, it is, it's not a lot of money uh, in Medicaid in, in, in your hospital, but it's, uh, it's looking like a 59% drop and I'm just in your projection, and I'm um, just wondering, what, where that comes from? What is your thinking about that? Okay, so I'm going to answer that in two parts. Um, the, the first part is that uh, as a percentage of our business, Medicaid eroded at, uh, during uh, current year, uh, projected FY18. Uh, 
as a percentage of business. And, and uh, Medicare is, has gone up significantly, and commercial has gone down, as I testified earlier. And so um, that's part of it. Part of it is also the service mix. So where the services are, are, what services are being done for folks in comparison to each other. And, and then the, la the second piece of, of my response is that uh, we, we did get a call from Lori Perry uh, yesterday afternoon or email and we had a subsequent phone call. And, uh, and when we looked at it, when I looked at it in detail this after, uh, yesterday afternoon, I felt like it was, it was a little bit overstated. Uh, the net works out in the P&L, but it was overstated, and uh, we probably could have done a better job. What I came to learn was that what's an adaptive, and then what was done in some of these other um, spreadsheets that are not linked to adaptive, we, we did it based on our internal numbers. You guys slice a little bit differently than we do, so I'd be happy to tighten that up over the next couple days and, and, and send that a revised version, but it'll get better than that, but it won't go away. Lori and I did spend some time on that yesterday. It was, it was um, a good observation. Um, in terms of bad debt, you're, in the narrative, uh, it said, um, I have the quote written down here somewhere, but uh, it said, I think, uh, um, that it was basically tough, bad debt and free care were basically tied to changes in uh, gross revenue, and in another area, it was not significant. But uh, there again, uh, you're looking for bad debt to go up by 29% and uh, free care up by 13%. And those those are big numbers um, uh, percentage-wise. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, we're expecting um, some unfavorable results uh, relative to out-of-pockets and the individual mandate rollbacks. I think you guys talked about that during the Blue Cross hearing. Um, so we're expecting to get hit on that. If you look at our percentages over the last several years, uh, you'll see that we've had some years uh, bigger than that uh, and some years smaller than that. So uh, we just dealt with the mandate and some of the out-of-pocket issues. I think the total dollars is $253,000 in, in total between the two. Um, and certainly we prefer to categorize and process things as uh, financial assistance and free care versus bad debt. But we, we do look at the two of them as a, as a percent of gross revenue year to year. And so we are going up as a percentage. Um, it is actually lower. It was just a few years ago. We were budgeting a total of 4% for the two items. And uh, we've ratcheted that down, but we're expecting to have a bump up next year. Um, regarding trappers, um, uh, is it, do you find it hard to get a trapper when you need one? Is, uh, so you get, well, correct. all the hospitals are having a hard time filling core positions. But so when you need a trapper, are they part of So I'll just so I manage some clinical areas as well as financial areas. And so um, the three uh, really busy departments that I manage that are clinical, um, we have uh, somebody who one moved to another part of the country and didn't even take a job somewhere else they want they wanted to relocate. And uh, we literally could not get a travel arrangement for respiratory therapy, could not get one for any amount of money. Uh, for a month, uh, because they're just not out there. Um, that's like the worst example. Uh, and then on, on the nursing side, uh, we did a very good job for a number of years when I was first, uh, I got there in 2013, basically fiscal year. Um, did a really good job of managing that, especially in the nursing areas. Uh, and now, with uh, um, the way the market is, we're having a harder and harder time. And we used to have one company we went with, and now we've got four on contract. And um, it's, it's radiology techs, lab techs, RT techs, nurses. I mean, it's, it's a growing concern. And we haven't changed how we're managing that problem. Uh, we're, we're really looking at all the creative solutions we looked at in 2013, 14, and 15. 16 when we just had a couple hundred grand a year, not a big deal, really good result. And now we're going to annualize at 1.2 million. And uh, we've improved wages during that time. Uh, we've improved the, the work environment during that time. We, we've done all those things that uh, should have made it better, but in fact, we're caught in the same morass as everybody else. On the, uh, on the buyer side, uh, you can find uh, locums <coughs> positions. They cost a fortune. And I always say there's a reason why 
folks to come welcome them. So they usually wear out their welcome after six to eight weeks, uh, wherever they are. Um, uh, and in the world of uh, non-consistent EMRs, it, it, we're just, we can't plug and play physicians in, 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 in any place. Um, unless you're using Cerner on a community works platform like we use it, uh, half of their locum assignment is spent trying to learn how to use the EMR. And as I said, they, they, they cost a, a fortune. It's incredibly disruptive um, to bring in locals. Uh, well, the way I've dealt with it is I've hired recently retired uh, docs from DH, who I know from my prior life uh, in, in Lebanon, and bring them down and uh, have them work half time. Uh, and that has worked well. Uh, bringing in locums from Wisconsin, who's never been to uh, Windsor for eight weeks, three months, it, it's a, an immense challenge. Uh, and the same goes with nursing. Uh, there is a flex pool of nurses for DHH for the whole system. Uh, but again, it's uh, amongst the you know, five partner institutions. Uh, we're making progress on having consistent EMRs, but there's still uh, you know, four EMRs. And uh, uh, one of the reasons that we actually brought on a nurse informaticist is to help with that as well, to help nurses at the elbow. Um, who are new to the system be able to reliably keep the medication for that side it is uh, it's challenging. I mean, the reason why I ask that question is I'm just wondering if there's a price point between what you're willing to pay for a person on staff and uh, the travelers. And if it's easy to get a traveler that's somewhere between where you are and where that traveler cost is, it might be a price point. But I'm getting the sense that. Uh, uh, for, for non-physician uh, folks uh, in physicians, uh, we have provided some incentives for staff to pick up additional shifts or, or whatnot. Um, that's, that's good for a couple weeks, um, but that is a huge dissatisfier. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're providing that opportunity some, for some folks. Um, we're limiting that opportunity so it doesn't become a burnout issue. Um, but it's sometimes that when we're waiting to get a traveler in, uh, that's what we do for a week or two. Um, so we're incentivizing and trying to minimize that, uh, but it's not a good ongoing solution to just work your staff, no matter how well they're being paid or whatever bonus money they might be getting. And my last question is, um, in negotiating reimbursement rates with the commercial insurers, um, does Dartmouth Hitchcock do that for you, or do you do that on your own? So, great question. Um, so, I do, uh, so NIA, that big kind of buying group we talked about, they have some relationships with a firm, Helmsing Company, out of Concord, New Hampshire. And they provide some uh, data analysis for us and some uh, negotiation support. And so, and it's really being a border hospital. I have to know all the New Hampshire payers, and I, and, and I have to know all the Vermont payers. And so I meet with them once a quarter. They give me a brain dump of everything that's going on in New Hampshire. And then I know what's going on in Vermont through the Hospital Association up here. And then we have at it. Um, Dartmouth, uh, there's not one Dartmouth contract that I am a party to. And there is not one contract with a payer from our shop that they're a party to. Uh, we have looked at that, and that is probably one of the things down the road, uh, but it is extremely complicated because they're larger. They have much more aggressive terms, and I'm not talking about dollars. I'm talking about complicated fee schedules and, and things that we just don't have the bandwidth to monitor and manage within my shop. But over time, as the integration continues, I may be able to utilize their support and then move to a, you know, a higher percentage of fee schedule driven models and, and incentives and things like that. But right now, we just we just take care of our own stuff, and then so far it's worked out okay. Thank you. I just wanted to talk a little bit about your relationship with Dr. Hitchcock. I mean, obviously, that's you know helped a lot in, in bringing patients and, and kind of shifting across the border. I just wonder, um, so for 2018, um, you talked about you kind of take higher acuity patients, you bring them in, and you know, you've, you've had a forecast for a subsidy from Dartmouth-Hitchcock. And you turned out your financials were better, and it may not just be been from that area, it may have been some of the cost-cutting things you're doing in other areas. 
And so that subsidies was taken away, about 800,000. And as we move into 2019, I don't th know if you have much of a subsidy from them. And I'm, I'm not saying that Dartmouth Hitchcock should be picking things up, but I'm just saying if, if we are taking these higher acuity patients and maybe subsidizing them through this network, um, and we're taking a rate increase next year of 3%, and you really want to push the prices down, how do we work to say what should we be getting from Dartmouth Hitchcock? Because, for instance, if you if we got in 19 a million dollars from Dartmouth Hitchcock, that's 2% of your rate increase we wouldn't need. And so I'm not trying to say do something unfairly, but I'm saying, you know, we're used as this hospital to help offset that, probably lose money on some of those patients. And because you ended up making a lot more money in 18, you didn't get your subsidies. So how, how do we work through that? So, so there is no subsidy uh, budget for FY19. Right. Uh, the, the second thing is that Dartmouth's expectation of critical access hospital uh, would be a 2% operating margin, which I don't think is unreasonable. Um, but they also recognize what we've been doing over the last few years and the benefits of the system. So uh, they were, uh, they said, if you guys can get break even and nail it, we're happy. So there's that piece of it. The second piece of it is we've gotten really good at taking these patients and managing them from a payer <laughs> reimbursement standpoint. Uh, the first year or two, we had uh, paid, we didn't really understand how all the New Hampshire Medicaid program worked, and since then we've we've gotten really smart. I mean, every week with care management, and we go through individual patients and scenarios and try to come up with a good discharge plan uh, that will minimize our hit. So I, I mean, there we look at this. We talk about Joe talks about it up at uh, at Dartmouth in his regular meetings. Um, I always look at it because it's the areas, uh, area of highest risk from day to day. Um, and, and I think that uh, Dartmouth would do whatever the right thing was for the system and for the patients and for us. Um, but right now, we're able to stand on our own with the types of patients they're sending us, and we're making it work. So um, we're kind of less interaction is somewhat uh, favorable to me because I just don't have, have any more meetings, honestly. Okay. And then uh, the last question is really on the ACO, kind of the accounting of what you have for the ACO. So you seem to have a bit of a mixed bag. So you have, I think you only have about 700,000 that you're showing on your, your FPP for the ACO, right? Because you're not showing the um, commercial or the um, Medicare payments. But you're talking about a reserve of a quarter of a million dollars. You have ACL fees of a quarter of a million dollars. You, you're talking about a miss potentially, you know, of up to half a million, you know, a reserve, um, a risk issue of potentially up to a million dollars. So I'm having trouble like, reconciling that. And the, and the other question, which we, you know, as a board are, are kind of struggling with, is how should we be? How should hospitals be accounting for the ACL? Um, should they be putting in risk reserves because that could go plus or minus, right? And we're, we're booking, everyone if they're booking is booking on the downside where it could go either way. And if in fact you are booking a reserve, that's impacting what you ask for a rate request. You know, if, if you work the math, right? If you put something in and, and we're working the math, you know, then, then you had specifically talked about that. So I guess and we may need to take offline specifically how you're recording for things, but in your, your FPP of only 800,000 that you put in and then all the risks you talk about is a disconnect. And it may be because of your late signing or your signing now and getting the other payers in there. But can we talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so um, I think uh, we're looking at it uh, entirely correctly. And, and again, we, I'm happy to have an additional discussion by phone or in person, yeah. so it's not an issue. Uh, but the, the $750,000 represents uh, what we understood to be our, our Medicaid fixed payment for the year, okay? And so because that fixed payment is not associated with any specific encounter of patient care, it is not according to the accounting uh, interpretations of the standards, Okay, in this case, PWC was had the best white paper I read on it. Um, that that is booked as other operating revenue. When the patients actually come in who are attributed to us, we take care of them like we normally do. We book the charges and send the bills like we normally do, and that goes into gross patient service revenue. We get what we call in our shop fake payments uh, back. It's 
so in our example, Medicaid for this year, we booked the gross revenue, we sent Medicaid the bill, and then there is a uh, fake payment that comes back electronically that uh, calculates what we normally would have been paid in cash and the contractual that we would normally receive, but they're both non-cash transactions. And so that increases contractuals, and that increases the gross revenue. Okay, now for the reserve, how we would book that. So we, we say, okay, what's our, our upside for the Medicaid program for FY18? It's, it's seven grand. So uh, that's only for nine months of the fiscal year because it's a calendar year program, and we start in October. So we would take the 70 grand, divide it by uh, uh, basically 12, multiply it by nine, so that's our risk for that fiscal period. And we would start booking those increments in January. As the year goes on and we see how we're performing against uh, uh, the expectation, we would either adjust up or down that risk on an ongoing basis to get to the finish line that we think we're going to get to, which may or may not be plus 70,000 or minus 70,000. So we're not booking 70 grand in January. We're booking uh, 70 divided by 12 times, uh, you know, that's what we're booking for the month of January. And then February we look. Now the biggest issue we're having, and I'm sure every other hospital has spoken to this, is the lag in the data. Just got March data. So we're, we're going to be closing August in, in a week. So, uh, you know, to, so it's really difficult to manage where you're going to go uh, and what you're booking. But that would be done incrementally during the course of the year. And as our performance is better or worse against the target, we would be adjusting that monthly reserve booking that runs to the p &L until we got to where we thought we were going to finish up. It's the same exact exercise we do for the cost report, mm -hmm. honestly. Okay, well, it's something we can take up with. Yeah. Some of your numbers in here, you talked about $500,000. Is there a best that's understated, five to 500, and things like that as well? Yes. And that was because we had no Medicare, we had no idea how many Medicare lives we had on July, uh, July 1st. We threw in a placeholder, we knew it was going to be at least $250,000. We threw in a placeholder of 250000 into the actual budget because we had no numbers. And so now, since then, we've gotten two iterations of attributed life for Medicare, Blue Cross, and Medicaid. And now we're seeing that uh, instead of 70000 for Medicaid and FY18, now we're looking at a potential million dollar uh, maximum risk. So, uh, and those aren't even final numbers. So. And just, I mean, we are considering FPP as a form of NPR. Um, even if, you know, there's a lot of different positions from auditors and things like that, but, you know, the way we're going to look at it is it's just a different method of payment for services for patients, but we are considering all possible as that as a part of it. And, and I'm fine with that because it nets the same at the bottom line, so I, I'm good with that. Yeah. And, and just a quick comment, you mentioned booking on upside risk, too, because I think you're probably only hearing that the hospitals are booking downside risk. I, I think that that's a safe bet for all of the hospitals, honestly. Uh, Medicaid, smaller risk order, we have 70,000 or so downside risk for 18. The risk order is increasing for Medicaid in, in 19, which is why it's actually going to be closer to just under 100 grand of pure Medicaid risk for 19 uh, for us. Uh, but if you look back historically at how Vermont's hospitals have done in Medicare shared savings programs, we've never really had uh, on, on a system level shared savings that, uh, of any significant amount. On Medicaid, we have done, we've, we've done reasonably well, but with our big spend being Medicare, uh, I'm being frank, very transparent here, I think it's unlikely that there would be any significant shared savings. I know the initial data for some of the hospitals that are in Medicare this year is that their fixed prospective payments, they're actually doing a little bit better under that program than they would in fee-for-service, and you can probably see the shadow fee-for-service data. Um, but I think that's going to come out in the wash over time, and I, I think we'll be lucky if we all bring, even in Medicare, um, but I think most hospital leaders are, are thinking that you know, there's going to be downside risk we're going to have to absorb. So booking upside, boy, it sounds great, but uh, I'm reluctant to do so. I think it's just it's booking nothing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Not, not booking upside. Yeah. If everybody books the risk, then 
in essence, it's got somewhat of a disincentive to do the ACO, and it, it does impact the rate when you put the puzzle together. If you want to have a bottom line operating profit and you're booking risk. I think there's a wait and see as well. I think if if, if 18, the hospitals in, in all three programs for 18 um, uh, actually do well, better, better than expected, I don't think we'll have any problem gaining the number of attributed lives we need moving forward because I think folks will be jumping in. With the discussions I've had with some of the other um, CFOs, you know, everybody is going to be booking these reserves incrementally as the year goes on, and it's to be based on the results. And so, um, you know, how that should have been recognized in a budget where nobody actually knows how this thing is going to play out, I don't, I don't really know. What I do know is that we're understated clearly uh, at this point, and uh, and I'm willing to live with the budget I submitted in that regard, and, and try to make the thing work. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is, it, it is done incrementally, and it should be looked at periodically during the course of the year to see if there is going to be an upside or not. And uh, our accounting firms, in order to produce, you know, clean financials, you know, it's all about the comfort and the trust of the reader. And uh, if we're not recognizing any risk and we're running towards risk, then um, the, the, we're, no way we're going to come into agreement with our auditing firm and, and produce clean financials. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, particularly impressed by the bold efforts with respect to harm reduction in the opioid epidemic. Um, and also the excellent work on the formulary redesign. And actually, one thing I would just say out loud here is I'm hoping that it can be scaled up and outward, some of the work you're doing. And I'm going to point to Jeff Keeman out there at Vox and hope that some of the learnings that you've done there can be spread to the other hospital community, community and others self the church. Um, I would be happy to get you in touch with the resource that I started with uh, for educational purposes. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be really helpful. I'm intrigued by that, especially having sat through many hospital budgets now with pharmaceutical drug pricing being the biggest expense driver in many of these budgets. We need to figure out ways, innovative ways, even at the margin, to start cutting those costs. So it sounds like you've done that, and I think we can all learn from that. Um, so the NPR, obviously, is higher than what we asked for. And I struggle with it because, on the one hand, it is higher than what we asked for. But on the other hand, you're a border hospital. And some of that NPR is coming in from out of state, right? And it's out of state payers. It's out of state commercial Medicaid um, paying that NPR. So it could be looked at as economic development for Vermont, right? So help me reconcile the big ask here with thinking about 30% of your revenue coming in from New Hampshire and how we can think about that differently. And again, the big issue is how do we, we don't, we don't market. You know, we're not driving business to us. And so when I look at the variances that we're seeing for, uh, you know, what I'll just use inpatient. Our inpatient uh, variance, favorable volume variance, has been driven by uh, general surgery inpatient procedures. So we budget like two a month, uh, historically. We've had months of six, which in the scheme of Vermont is nothing. For us, it's 300% increase of some of the most expensive acute patients we're gonna have. And so, but we, you know, you need, you need to have your appendix out, you need to have your appendix out. You know, people are price shopping, they're not, well, should I go to Montscott New, should I go to Valley? Then that, that's all off the table. They have general surgery, it's available, you can get it same day for urgent and emergent. That's where they're going. So we're so we don't really have a lot of control over that. I, I don't see us closing the ER uh, you know, in August because we hit our volume uh, for the year and we we had a thirty percent um, favorable variance in ER volume and not related to any clinic deficiency, just looking at the types of patients that are coming in. So we don't really have a lot of control of that. The other thing is, depending on what's going on at Alice Peck Day, Valley Regional Hospital, um, you know, and our other neighbors, um, we, we, we gain or lose because of that. If they're doing a really great job in something, we're probably losing. If we're, we're doing a better job in something, we might be gaining. We have no control over those things. And so that's the driver, and the, and the payer mix comes with the patient. And, and so we really, we struggle. We went through the payer mix, 
and the volume uh, repeatedly ad nauseum. Um, you know, my analyst is sitting over here, he's probably burning a hole in the side of my head because I made him redo it so many times. But um, I don't have an easy answer for you. I can quantify what those dollars look like coming in by payer from New Hampshire. I mean, I can do those things for you, but it's kind of flossum. It's, you know, I don't have a lot of uh, pull or influence over that. Um, so obviously workforce recruitment is a big concern. And I'm wondering, Joe, to some degree, you're, you sit on the one care for the board. You're very heavily invested in all the model. I very much appreciate that you're all in on all three payers. I'm wondering, we hear a lot about administrative burden. And I've often thought that the all payer model and fixed payment could potentially be a recruitment tool to the extent that providers, in particular primary care providers, are now going to be paid for care management with these additional PMPM payments, no, fewer prior authorizations through the Medicaid program. I mean, are you, is, are you seeing being all in the all care model as a mechanism to improve your recruitment efforts, um, particularly with primary care docs? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, doctors have moved to Vermont are, you know, we've had a preaching of the choir already, I think. Um, we, all, we all could have stayed in our, wherever we trained or wherever we worked previously. Um, and, and instead, we took a pay cut and moved up here long before the APM was uh, in play. Um, I think I think we overstate the value of the prior op waiver, honestly, because most practices have already put in support to deal with that incredibly onerous and irritating uh, part of the practice. Um, where the story that I that I tell in our primary care recruitment is, yes, we're part of an APM, we get fixed prospective payments, but even a couple years ago, we, we have moved entirely away in primary care from any RVU um, metrics or incentive or reimbursement. Our, primary care docs are straight salary. They have the opportunity to earn a little bit more. I call it a citizenship bonus. If you're serving on committees, if you're doing other work in the hospital, if you're doing some of the one care work, um, there's a little bit extra. But otherwise, it's a, it's a flat salary. Um, and whether you see, we'd like you to see, you know, 13 patients in a, in a day. Um, uh, but we are really moving away from from classic productivity benchmarks, and we're really just looking at, at more of wellness and, and, and outcomes. Um, I would love to incentivize around outcomes uh, as opposed to productivity, but we're not there yet either, and I think that scares people because I can't help but bring in my um, concerns around quality of the data by which we measure the outcomes. Um, you know, I use that the, the BMI issue uh, as an example, but. Um, so I, I think that's part of the part of the story, but we could we could see this train coming, and we uh, have, uh, like I said, moved away from uh, the RV model as, as uh, in clinic operations and entirely for, for compensation. But that that has been help. I, we've actually had some recent interest um, uh, in some primary care providers who were interested uh, in moving away from that model as well. I think a lot of them are, but our our, our pay is, is is a little bit more by going. A straight salary, non productivity. I, I can't. I can't pay what a, a productivity-driven model would, would provide. You're just ahead of your time. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, so you're also not a very productive player. <laughs> 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 um, in terms of uh, your, you know, you're all in in the all care model. I'm wondering if you're self-insured. So I've been asking this hospital, this question of all hospitals. Are your employees also attributed to one care? Or are you having those conversations with your GPA or your? Um, so uh, they're, they're not attributed. And I, I knew the question was coming. Well, I've had three weeks of it. Two I know, ago. exactly. <laughs> um, we, uh, we are on the glide path to getting on DHH benefits, a uh, common benefit platform across all of the uh, member hospitals. We've actually. Um, kind of uh, dug our feet in a little bit over the last couple years because it would be a, a significant expense for us to move to the uh, DH uh, benefit platform uh, at this time of a significant year over year increase. So um, thankfully, DHH leadership understands that. Um, but I, I, I do worry about 
moving those uh, our employees in, into uh, what care uh, attribution, knowing that uh, when they have to approve the whole thing again okay, under well, to 36 months of data if you want to come. No. That's kind of where we are. And my last question that I've been asking all hospitals to this relates to the beehive and the low, uh, we don't have a uh, majority of patients in Vermont are still not on the beehive because of patient consent obstacles. Yep. And so one of the, the vehicles through which we have come to understand that we can increase consent is through electronic consent through the EHRs at hospitals. And so it's apparently a very small uh, fix to the ADT phase. And I'm wondering if that would be considered adding that into your uh, budget or not adding into your budget, but basically thinking working with vital to try and increase electronic consent of patients through your EHR system. It's about 40 hours of IT time is what I mean. Yeah, um, so, so the answer definitely is yes. Um, we need to. We need a few small victories with vital. This, I think, would be one. Uh, we also have, um, uh, we could not only, we could, we could work on a parallel line, too, with our uh, patient portal through our EMR as well um, uh, to help with that. So I, I think that the short answer is yes, we should do that. A longer answer is uh, I really think we've got to be looking at some of the national health information exchanges. Um, uh, because they're doing the hard work to build conduits to the large EMR providers, Cerner, Epic. And we're we're going to be on Epic with probably in three years as part of DHH's system. Um, and they've already built the pipelines with um, Commonwealth, for example. Um, and if, if, if they have been within the resources to do that, it becomes you know, 30 minutes of IT time to connect up to Commonwealth versus 40 hours of IT time. Uh, the vital. Um, uh, but uh, if, if this is what we have to do in the intro to get there, um, then uh, the, we have to invest in it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for all the hard work. So my first question is, uh, focuses on your Vermont and New Hampshire patient mix. And has that been consistent historically? Uh, so in, in my five years, yeah, it's it probably, uh, we've only got a five year or two. Yeah. We're, we, are, we are seeing some movement in specific departments. Um, I did, as part of the submission, we did look at that. So the rehab unit, before we did the CON, I'll just use this as one example, we had an average daily census of 6.2 to 6.5. Uh, we had shared rooms, limited our access. So we did the CON, private rooms, and, and we said we're going to end up at 8.5, and guess where we're up? 8.5. That was great. Well, what's, what we found is those two extra patients a day, um, a majority of those annualized, are, are coming over the border. Um, and so we have picked up in that particular department. Primary care, probably not so much. And, and it's a whole different range. Uh, and then there are some departments we have literally zero New Hampshire business. Um, so we have cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab. So it's, it's a whole wide range, but at the end of the day, it's creeped up a couple points since I've been there. Um, if, if we were like the Wild West, like New Hampshire, um, I'd be running that thing silly. And, and if I didn't have to talk to you about getting that patient service revenue, you know, I'd be trying to steal everybody I could out of New Hampshire. So, um, so that's what it is. It has creeped up a little bit. It's not stellar, amazing, but it, it does happen, and we are seeing it in specific departments. The, uh, the acute rehab service line is, is unique. It, it's only us at UDM that have acute rehab facilities in Vermont, and we're the only um, car for accredited car is the Commission on Acute Rehab Facilities um, measure of, of quality and compliance uh, really for acute uh, rehab facilities across the country. We're, we're the only one in Vermont, and the closest one in Hampshire is down in Manchester. So that 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 is a that is a, a goal of some of our New Hampshire business because patients are actually asking about uh, quality and outcomes in, in, in our in the rehab units. So I don't want to sound like a broken record, but uh, obviously if you are bringing patients in from out of state, that's not um, factoring in the total cost of care calculations for us. And uh, if you can document the Delta, this board has been receptive 
In fact, we were receptive a year ago for Southwestern because they could prove to us the increase that came to them from the closing of the clinic in uh, Hoosick, New York by uh, uh, Glens Falls Hospital and from the closure of the hospital in North Adams, Mass. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't try to say that the Green Mountain Care Board is an impediment to bringing those people from New Hampshire because we certainly don't want you to view it that way. Um, I'm assuming that Medicare reimbursement, you're getting the same, whether they're Vermont or New Hampshire. Um, what's the variance between uh, Medicaid rates between Vermont and New Hampshire? Uh, leaving the managed Medicaid aside, uh, uh, so I find that Vermont and New Hampshire are pretty close in my experience. Um, the payment methodologies aren't always the same, but they still seem to be netting approximately the same. Um, I have not looked at that since probably the end of last fiscal year, and I'd be willing to take a good glance at it, but it was, it was commensurate. The issue where we get burned is that we're not able to provide all services to all the Hampshire Medicaid people. Whereas, because we're here in the state, whatever we offer is, is theoretically eligible for payment with the Medicaid programs up here. So when we have uh, subacute ICF level patients from New Hampshire, uh, we're getting little or nothing for those patients. So there's a couple exceptions that we have to really be, pay attention to. So not for this uh, hospital budget process, but if you could just take a look at that sometime when you have a few extra minutes and uh, you know, just let us know you know, what you're, you're saying. Um, can you break down for us what percentage of your chart master is being reimbursed by commercial insurance on average? And again, is that better or worse on each side of the river? If, 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 if I had my, uh, my presentation from April, I could just put a slide up for you. But I don't recall what those numbers were, uh, are and were, and I don't have it um, broken out between New Hampshire and Vermont. What I can tell you is that from a commercial perspective, uh, uh, obviously our physicians are fee schedule, that's true for pretty much everybody. Um, inpatient generally is a percentage of charge on both sides of the river. Uh, and uh, outpatients for some of our, uh, what I would call larger, more significant uh, contracted relationships, we have fee schedules for lab, radiology, and PT but uh, not for the other outpatient services. So I mean, I, would, I, I actually have that information just not split between New Hampshire and Vermont, but I could probably use it to do that. Okay, that would be helpful. Um, if you were to get your 2.9% increase in rate, how would, obviously we're talking about a Vermont regulatory body uh, decision. How does it impact your rates on the New Hampshire side? Well, every, every service is charged the same regardless of the state of origin of the patient, the payer, and, and that's pretty much a, a federal regulation. So, so that's, that's what your pricing would be, but your reimbursement may be different. Our commercial rates on both sides of the river are pretty close. There's not a lot of difference between Anthem and, and Vermont Blue Cross. Okay. Probably venturing into territory I shouldn't be venturing into, but that's not the deal. So as a, as a percentage of your uh, your chart master again, what would that percentage be for a commercial reimbursement? I, I, I guess I don't understand the charge master part of that question. So um, say that you have, and we'll use simple numbers, uh, a procedure that's $100. Um, what percentage of that $100 is going to be reimbursed by your commercial payers? Well, it, it, it's, it's going to, well, I can't give you that percentage, is it? but it's in your schedules. Um, you can actually see it in your schedule, so I guess I can share it. But we're looking at 70 cents to the dollar probably realized out of that increase. And then it would be similar on both sides of the river, within a percentage point or two. Does that help? It does. Okay. I guess my point is that you get a 2.9% rate increase, you're going to get 70% of that from a commercial payer. Yeah, from commercial payers. We're going to get zero from Medicaid. Exactly. Um, on workforce, 
Um, has Dartmouth considered uh, trying to do anything with scholarships or anything that uh, would entice uh, students to stay within the system? Um, there are uh, uh, LNA or licensed nursing assistant training programs um, uh, that, that uh, DH is sponsoring. Um, we have reached out to local community colleges to do the same. We've talked about developing scholarship opportunities uh, for some Windsor High School students uh, as well. Our auxiliary supports that um, also. Uh, I, I think we need to do more of that. I think we need to identify uh, existing students and go to them and offer them uh, it's basically free tuition for their training programs for radiology techs, for lab techs. Um, you know, there, there are talent pipeline working groups statewide in each state that, that we're, we're a part of. Um, DH and DIA um, also have, uh, have tried to build those uh, relationships. Uh, even, even with that, I, I, I pessimistically, I don't, I don't think we, we have enough workers. I just, I just don't. Um, and I think we're going to have to, uh, even if we maximize our graduating seniors and community college students and college students, um, there, there still are not enough folks, I think, that are willing to stay. I think mean, folks have to go out for a while and then come back. Uh, kind of like I grew up in New Hampshire, as did they, um, same town, actually. And, um, you know, we came back, but that was after spending some, some time away. Um, I, I think DH uh, is thinking creatively about this around workforce housing, as are we. Um, changing the workforce week, maybe your maybe a full-time job is three days, one week, four days, the next week. And by the way, when you're, even though you live in Manchester, New Hampshire, or you live in Southern Vermont, we'll provide housing for you while you come up and work those three days. Um, and we'll also provide the high-speed bus or high-speed rail line, um, you know, to uh, Southern New Hampshire or wherever the population uh, exists. Now, we, we don't really have that option in Chittenden County. They, 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 uh, that, that county is growing, and, and, and UVM has their own workforce needs as, as well. But we are trying to coordinate our, our, our workforce efforts. Um, but we just, you know, we don't have the horses. <laughs> we don't have the people. Um, and I think we've got to go where the population is growing after we maximize our own internal resources. Seems to be a disconnect, though, because uh, so many of the youth believe that they have to leave the state to, to seize opportunities, yeah. and yet we know that's not true with healthcare. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious if you're doing anything as far as reaching out, on, like having career days in middle school or working with any guidance counselors to try to get people tuned into the fact that um, there are some tremendous opportunities yeah. here in the state. Yeah, we are. We, we do a lot of shadowing opportunities. Uh, we uh, have a strong role in the school nursing offices for all of our school nurses. But we actually were just talking about this, uh, about getting into the guidance counselors and just really hosting open houses and, um, uh, and, 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 and getting into the schools. I know you know, Dave goes back to our, our high school and talks about the opportunities in, in, in healthcare. Um, and uh, I think there, there is opportunity in healthcare, but uh, convincing students that that is their opportunity is also a challenge. I know that speaking with our auxiliary members, um, they sponsor scholarships for graduating uh, high school seniors uh, who are committed to a, a career in healthcare. Uh, typically, the path has been in nursing, um, and uh, they haven't had any graduating senior going into healthcare for the last couple years, despite uh, efforts and despite a lot of strong community effort by Joe Lord and, and, and her team. So that, that part is discouraging. It's, it's not just the opportunity part, it's the opportunity in healthcare. And this is why this is why it's a great job and a great career for a profession. Uh, we have to work on that part. And you look at uh, 1.2 million uh, plus in uh, travelers. Uh, generally, what we hear is that uh, that's about 200% uh, yeah. of what would have been the cost. So right there alone, we have well over half a million dollars of savings that could occur if we could just include that workforce flow. 
I did have a, a student uh, shadow me last year for uh, half a day. He told me my job sucks. <laughs> True story. Are you wearing a green eye shade? <laughs> With that, I'm going to turn it over to Julia Shaw from the Healthcare Advocate. Hi. Did everybody hear me okay? I just have a few follow up questions, clarifying questions today. Um, so, you mentioned in your presentation um, that pulling resources from across the world, I assume that means from Dartmouth, um, could allow you to reduce your prices. I'm wondering if you can clarify and expand on that a little bit. Um, I think. There are, there are, I think, two sets of, of resources that are coming from out of state and final sky. On the, on the clinical side, yeah, we, we, we are able to bring clinicians, physicians down to help provide specialty services that, we, um, uh, that our community needs. And I think of GI services, cardiology, tele, uh, televideo support. Um, but resources, I think, that would allow, and, and all those things do generate some revenue, certainly. But I think the resources, uh, we're talking really about, if there's an increased bulk of New Hampshire business, meaning New Hampshire patients that are coming across, especially on the rehab side, which we've mentioned a couple of times, um, uh, financial benefit that would allow uh, price to increase. And I share Dave's concern about cost of Gas scans, cost of physical therapy resources. I think PT is a, would be a big target for us because that's one of our real strengths and what we provide to the community. And um, the private, non uh, private, for profit PT groups around us, um, you know, have cut their prices and are, and are pulling business actually into New Hampshire and away from Vermont because all the big centers are. Are in uh, Hampshire and London for physical therapy. So I think that's that's really the, the resources coming across here. The resources probably should we should have waited with patients. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Um, and then you highlighted the lack of harm reduction services currently available in your community. Um, and you also mentioned that it was going to be a focus for 2019. So I'm wondering if you can talk about any concrete plans or steps that you have for the year um, and how you're planning to build stakeholder buy-in on um, yeah. these types of uh, services. So I'll start with stakeholder buy-in. Um, when the director of your emergency room feels like you're just substituting one of you for another and doesn't believe in long-term NAT non-absent space programs, uh, that's a discussion that needs to happen. Uh, and so I met with him yesterday, and uh, uh, we're, we're, we're starting that journey uh, together. And as a, as, a, as a doc, I felt the same way for quite a while. Um, but the data is, is the data. And we know that there are rising rates of, of Hep C, rising rates of HIV, and I really latched on to the saying, you know, you can't get into recovery if you're dead. Right? So we need to reduce harm. We need to prevent overdose deaths. Because all this work we're doing around MAT access, great. We have, to, we have no problem with access. And we're not prescribing opioids anymore. But there's a whole generation that, that, that also contributes to, the, to our workforce issues that are just, that, that, that are apps that need to get into recovery. You know, often they, some of the uh, data around, around getting into recovery is you, know, you need eight attempts at recovery to get one year of stable recovery. So um, it's hard for providers to wrap themselves around that. So sharing that data is the first step in getting stakeholder um, buy-in. Stakeholder buy-in also is in the community. You know, needle exchanges, that's a, that can be a hot topic, uh, let alone observed injection sites, which some um, uh, some communities are strongly conservative. I think Windsor's, Windsor's a pretty conservative community. We're, we're a ways from that, but if we could get to a uh, needle exchange program, I think that would be a great concrete first step. Uh, actually, it would be the second step. Our first step was designated, designating a site for free dark camp um, distribution, which we were able to do. Actually, one of my uh, hospitalists uh, said, we got to be doing this, and we coordinated with our, our largest uh, NAT uh, provider, which is just off campus to, to have him, you know, because he has 100 plus patients there, to be in our camp distribution site. And that may be the end up where we do our needle exchange um, as well. But again, if we stick with the mantra, we can't get into recovery if you're dead, um, then that, I think, clarifies the harm reduction picture for a lot of people. Thank you. That's all my questions. 
to this point, I'll open it up to the public for anyone who has a public comment about the um, special budget. Dale. Good. Quick question on how the workforce is actually affect, affecting pricing. Uh, other than that, I think it comes back really well. I want to comp compliment them on their attitude toward data. It just seems exceptional how they use it as a tool rather than. Um, the other one would be children. I didn't see a whole lot about how the children are doing that they serve. I was just wondering if they had any feedback on that. Um, sure. Uh, we, uh, we have two interesting pediatrics practices in, uh, in our, health, uh, our health system. The Windsor Pediatric Practice is a different population of kids that are Woodstock pediatric uh, practice. Um, socioeconomics are different between the town and some incredibly high need um, uh, uh, pediatrics patients in, in Windsor. There's still need that, that I think is sometimes understate in, in Woodstock, but a little bit different uh, of a bet. We've actually increased our our, our pediatric FDD in, in Woodstock because it does seem that the population does seem to be nudging upward a little bit. For the for our high need, uh, our higher need patients and their families, um, we've done we started a couple of programs. One is um, a family coaching service um, that we started with high risk patients and now rolling it out to all. Uh, patients in the pediatric practice in Windsor, so we actually have grant support to have family wellness life coaching for patients uh, and their families to try to avoid um, uh, ACEs, uh, these, these uh, catastrophic events in, in, in childhood or adverse childhood events that tend to have long-term implications on the patient's health and well-being. Um, uh, again, we, we've struggled with some of the blueprint data around our practice profile in, in, in pediatrics. Uh, I think we're ironing that out over time, and whenever we're not convinced that the data is accurate, we just do real-time chart reviews to make sure that we're doing it. Um, in, in Woodstock, we are considering uh, actually having some pediatric office hours in, in, at the school, actually at the school, having one of our pediatricians um, uh, spend some time uh, every week or every other week at, at, at Woodstock. And, uh, see Dave's hair falling out a little quicker with uh, something like that, uh, because that's certainly not going to uh, help the bottom line, but I think it would be a, an important adjunct. Uh, so I think our pediatric practices are, are, are doing well. We have, we have stable staffing. We were able to replace uh, one of our uh, Woodstock pediatricians who have been in practice for 30 to 40 years, and we recruited someone from out of state to, to uh, fill his big shoes. Um, so I, I think we're I think we're doing well. We're, we, we sometimes struggle with two distinct populations of needs. And looking at our Medicaid data, uh, Medicaid data, our highest spend, highest utilizers in Medicaid are our pediatric patients in Windsor, and it's all uh, the psychosocial dynamic and socioeconomic stresses that they that they have, and some real. Um, uh, intense psychiatric needs that uh, thankfully we have a rather long retreat to, to lean on. But I will say that we um, have just hired a new psychiatrist that is also board, board certified in pediatric um, psychiatry, so that's going to be a great help as well. So, is there any other public comment? Seeing none, thank you, Team Model Scutney. Uh, Teresa and Wendy, we're we really appreciated the, the depth of the conversation. <laughs> but with those two guys, you don't need to say much, right? <laughs>